Hey there. I am glad to be with you here this Saturday afternoon, a little later than I usually do Facebook Lives. But I am, um, hey, we got some people showing up on here. So, um, glad you guys are joining me. I don't know how the weather is where you are, but here in southeastern Virginia, it is cold and surprise wet. I mean, wet. <laughs> hey, Claire, I thought you were going to be off on some science program. Hi, Helen. Um, hello, Franklin, North Carolina. So, um, today I'm coming to you talking about just some general seed starting strategies. I want to share kind of some thoughts on that. Hey, Amy, um, and uh, your Saturday highlight. Well, thanks. I kind of enjoy doing it too. And I really do try to do this on Saturday because I do realize that a lot of folks um, have a Monday through Friday job. So sometimes I will be doing them during the weekdays, but when I can, hello, cousin Alma and Wanda in Alaska. Um, so I've really been trying to do them every week and trying to do them on Saturdays. And, um, oh, Debbie, snowy north, northern Colorado. I just came from Denver. And when I left, it was 12 degrees there. But thank goodness, no snow. And hey, Daniel and Lisa from Georgia. So, as always, I have things I want to say before I start chit-chatting. First off, um, we're going to be talking about strategies. I'm not going to teach anybody how to start seeds on this. Hey, Denise. Um... I'm not teaching anybody how to, that doesn't know how to start seeds here, but I'm going to give you some resources that you can go to. So the first thing I want to say is that um, if you want to keep on top of what's going on with the Gardener's Workshop, these kinds of things, Facebook Lives and other um, resources, be sure to subscribe to my newsletter, and that's at thegardenersworkshop.com. Right at the top, sign up, and we'll send you some free spring resources, but you'll also then start getting our weekly newsletter. And y'all are doing such a great job, but I just want to remind you that after this broadcast is over, if you like it and share it, that saves it on your feed forever, and that helps me so very, very much. And also, all of the Lisa Lives here on Facebook about like the Thursday after the Lisa Live, Kelly downloads the video and adds it on my blog. So you can always find them there. And if you go to my blog and find one Lisa Live, I have them categorized and you can click the category and it'll bring up all of them so you can check them out. And I'm really trying to stay on topic. That way, um, it's just easier for people to go back and watch them and to see where they're looking for something, you know? It just makes it a whole lot easier. So, three things that I want to be sure to say. First off, if you need help seed starting, I mean, if you don't know how to seed start or if you're trying to learn how to soil block or if you need to learn how to be successful sowing seeds out in the garden, then my online course, Seed Starting Made Easy, it's $19.95, and I'm going to give you a coupon code to get $5 off. So for $14.95, I take you through how to figure out when to start seeds for your area, for whatever you're growing, then how to do it indoors with soil blocking and outdoors. Um, the code, you just go to the on, go to my website, go to the online courses, go to the, what's it called? Seed Starting Made Easy. Select that and hit buy. And the coupon code is easy, E-A-S-Y. And that'll give you 15 bucks off. Hi, Erin. I met Erin and um, got to see her in when I was in, where was I? In Seattle. So you can purchase the online course for seed starting, and if you're not familiar with online courses, it's just like buying a book. It's instead of picking the book up and reading it, you just log into your library online from any device. 
you have it for life. You can watch it as many times as you'd like, and it will be there forever. Um, oh, Lynn, you have four inches of snow. I'm so, I mean, I'm pretty grumpy about the rain down here, but I am even happier that it's not snow. And Susan, I'm sure it is snowing in New Hampshire. Good gracious. So that's the first thing I wanted to tell you. The $5 off coupon for the online seed starting course is easy, is the coupon code, okay? So check that out. And also, I know that many of you are probably already signed up for my free webinar on what it takes to be a flower farmer. You can just, again, go to thegardenersworkshop.com, go to the online courses, and it's right there on the menu. Sign up. I've upgraded. We had hundreds and hundreds of people sign up for it. And I went ahead and purchased the next level, which means I get more people that can come to the webinar. It's March 19th. And it's just like this Facebook Live. You can join it live and then ask questions and things. Or if you sign up and don't attend live, we will then send you the link to watch it anytime. So, um, that's really a cool thing. We, I've never done a lot webinar. The difference between that and this is I'll be able to slow show some slides. Um, so it's more like a program. It can be me or it can be my screen on my computer. So we'll fumble through it and figure it out. And then the other thing I want to say before I get started is that so many of the questions that I, first off, I'm receiving hundreds of questions each week via email, which I just cannot answer. There's just not enough time in the day. But most of those questions are already answered in my book, Vegetables Love Flowers. Most of them are answered in Vegetables Love Flowers. So I want to say to you, if you need help figuring out how to get started, when, where to locate your garden, what does your garden need, how to take care of it organically, what should I grow for a cutting garden, how to attract pollinators and beneficial insects to my garden. It is all in Vegetables Love Flowers. And I just took up, you know, it's so funny how I just kind of forget what is in different resources. Um, and so I just opened the book and started looking at it. I mean, it talks about building your garden soil, talks about how to do your pathway so you don't have to do weeding. I cover seed starting. Um, there's, let's see how many pages. There's three and a half, four pages on seed starting, which are great tips and also for pinching where and when you pinch transplants um, and how to use row cover. So if you just, it's an overall big picture. So I'm just saying this because from the questions that I'm getting, I know that we have a lot of folks that are new gardeners or just trying to do things better and differently and have more enjoyment from their garden this year. The book tells it, you just need to read the book, okay? Then if you want a deep dive on growing cool season flowers, of course, my book, Cool Flowers, will take you down that rabbit hole. and. Um, we are currently now planting more cool flowers out in the garden here in southeastern Virginia. Um, negative five, Wanda. Wanda, you need to move south, girl. Alaska is cold. Um, so I just wanted to, and I'll, I'll mention that again as we get more and more people kind of joining with us, that so many of the questions that I'm being asked, I've already provided resources for that. And that way you can really use the resources and kind of build your knowledge, right? And that's what we want to do. So I'm just going to talk a minute about my seed starting strategy. Many of you know that I love to soil block. I soil block because of my circumstances. I do not have a greenhouse and I've never had a greenhouse and I can't have one here in the city. So soil blocking just really fit perfectly for me to tweak it into being able to do it inside this building. This is my big workshop that I'm talking to you from. And I have a room where I do all my seed starting. So it's just like if it's in your home, it's just like a spare bedroom. You know, I use racks and um, grow lights and trays that do not have drainage holes. However, 
I do uh, sometimes use other methods of seed starting. For instance, sometimes I do use plug trays. And I'll show you, I don't know if y'all can see them or not, but I brought some of my seedlings in from outdoors because um, they're sitting outside getting hardened off. And you can see that there's some plug trays and there's also a tray with some soil blocks. So I am by no means a purist. Um, in that manner because I actually had over on Instagram or Facebook, I forget where it was, somebody was so surprised to see um, the book. They were so surprised to see my Buplurum in plug trays. So I do use them both. Y'all, I do whatever it takes to work. So I just wanted to put that out there. And I also do do some direct seeding and very limited because direct seeding out in the garden is more work. You have to waste more seeds, right? Because you have to over sow because stuff happens outside. It's not as easy to get a strong germination out there in this environment that you're not controlling, right? So I do do some direct seeding primarily, almost exclusively in the fall. Although I do do some very early spring vegetable direct seeding. I just planted, um, they were actually just breaking ground. We planted our beets and also our bush peas right before I went away. So let's see, I got home Monday. I was gone for 12 days. So it's like 14 or 15 days ago. So I do do some direct seeding and what you need to I think sometimes folks get so gung-ho with one way, they just let that block them. I do, Barry is moving around down here. What are you doing, girl? She's laying her head on my foot. Um, I do whatever works for me, okay? So, soil blocking, I use 95% of the time. When do I not soil block? Soil blocking, um, if a seed needs a long time to grow, a really long time, like the eucalyptus that I started back in January that won't be planted outside until almost April. That's a really, because it's a slow grower, just like Lysianthus. They just need a really long growing period. Well, it's just more difficult to maintain soil blocks for over six or seven weeks. They just, things happen to them. They start to break down because you're watering the heck out of them. They can grow algae. And so I just find it easier to use plug trays. And that's another reason that I put Buplurum seeds. Somebody asked me, um, oh, I thought you planted those in the fall. I do direct seed Buplurum in the fall because it's just too warm inside at that time, because that for me is like September. We're still pretty warm um, in our grow room. It's too warm in that room to get Buplurum to germinate. However, planting them out in the garden with the nights getting cooler, that works. Well, this time of the year, when we're trying to plant some additional succession um, plantings of Buplurum, it is cool enough in that room that we have great success, which I'll show you, doing that. So I do do different methods for different things, and you might just try to figure that out too. You know, if you have something that you have a really slow, long, hard time to germinate, for instance, I germinated eucalyptus in small blocks, but then once they started to get a little size on them that I felt pretty good about them, um, instead of potting them up to a two inch block, I just dropped them into plug trays because it's just easier to maintain them over the long haul, which they are still have another month and a couple of weeks before they'll go out in the garden. So there's a lot of different ways that I do things and I've just kind of figured them out. There's no hard rule for everybody. So one of the things that I really wanted to talk about today is succession planting. So many folks don't really understand what that means, and it is so key for several things, for spreading out, whether you're growing vegetables or flowers, or just growing a garden at your house, you know, a little home garden out back. It spreads out the harvest or the display, and it also spreads out the work. So let's just say you had an acre. Let's just say I have an acre garden. 
instead of me, and it is so easy for this, I did this for several years too, by the way, and I know a lot of people do it. Spring comes and you have started so many seeds, you pretty much plant your entire garden all at one time. Not only does that create a seed starting problem because nobody has enough room to start and support that many seeds typically at one time, but they have to be started. That's a lot of work in itself. You have to maintain them. Few people have enough lights to support that many seedlings all at one time. Then they all have to be planted at one time. Then they all start to um, bear fruit or flowers at one time. I cannot tell you how much succession planting will change your life. You, but you have to resist planting your entire garden. I thought I brought a tissue out here. Excuse me, y'all. I just need to grab a tissue here. My allergies are so much worse now that I'm at home in Virginia than it was when I was even in Seattle. So succession planting will change your life. But here's the problem. We're all so excited right now. So I'm in Southeastern Virginia, zone 7B. My last frost date is typically mid-April. So we right now are just finishing planting up some cool flowers, you know, we planted in the fall, most of them, but some of them can't winter over here as well as some of them we wanna plant again right now. So we're just finishing that up. That's why I have Bupleurum and Status sitting behind me and Lysianthus, because by the way, Lysianthus is a cool flower. It'll take cold really, really well. So we're finishing planting those up. Well, we're on the verge now I think this coming week, Bobo will start starting our warm season tender annuals. You know, azuratum, the coxcombs, the plumes, the sunflowers, millets, gumfrina, basil, tomatoes, squash, all of the warm season stuff. And I understand wanting to start so much so many different things and starting probably more of them than you really need, which we always start more than we need because stuff happens. But we then make choices when it comes time to plant those. So let's just say that we start, because we are, we're starting probably 10 trays of 240 on each tray. Each tray has one color of coxcomb on it. Well, I don't have enough room for 240 of every color out in our garden. But I start more because sometimes not every block germinates. Sometimes, you know, stuff just happens. A seed misfires. It doesn't germinate. So we always start more transplants than we think we need. But then the challenge starts. You have to resist planting them all. What, this is what I tell Bobo when she goes out to plant. You have 20 feet of bed for that particular tray. You pick the strongest, the nicest, and the biggest, and then work your way through the tray, right? Picking the nicest plants. Do not waste a spot on, you know, if all the transplants are, you know, three to four inches tall and beautiful, and you come to one that's only this tall, he doesn't probably look bad. He's just smaller than everybody else. Well, he's just not as um, ready to go to the garden as the rest of them. So we plant only the strong, right? So succession planting means you've got to leave space. So let's say, say we have that acre. What I personally do is I break my garden into thirds, and I talk about this in depth in Vegetables Love Flowers, y'all. You can apply it to your small backyard garden or to your farm. I break it into thirds and I plant a third. Actually, a third was planted last fall, right, in cool flowers. And a few of those beds were left for very early spring. So basically a third are in cool flowers. The next third of my garden will be planted with the first summer rotation of summer annuals. And that is everything. That is all of our cut flowers that we're growing, the tomatoes we're growing, the squash, peppers, if we're, you know, whatever warm season first planting has to go into that next third. So it's like you have to start picking and choosing between your kids, right? But you have to resist 
which is really hard. I understand better than anybody. Then the last third of your garden is where we plant the next summer rotation. I do them about four to six weeks later. So my first summer rotation goes in for me, like from mid-April to May 1st. It takes us about that long to get everything planted and to get the garden set up, right? And then during that same time, we're starting seeds for the next summer rotation. So this not only spreads out how much heat mat space you have, how much grow light space you have, how much sitting outside under the carport getting hardened off space you have. Um, and I, I want to say that I see y'all are putting questions in. I will go back through, when, after I answer the pre-questions, when I finish talking, I'll then go back through and answer your questions. Um, so while your, while your first rotation is planted, during that time, you're starting the seeds for the next set, um, succession planting. And you have your spot already, you know, we're making beds during that time or preparing the area for whatever's gonna be planted. In the meantime, guess what? We've been harvesting the heck out of cool flowers. I mean, there is no lack of things to do, um, but you allow yourself to, to have time to do everything. I can't tell you how this changes everything. And another thing I wanna, you know, we're known, and Barry is laying right where I need to stand. Excuse me, girl. Move just a little bit, there you go. Um, this is really important for annual flowers, but it's also important for annual vegetables. I never really thought about this with vegetables. I mean, I knew that I needed to succession squash. Many, I don't know if you guys do, but we have the squash bug here, which is really a problem, and all of a sudden one day you come out and your squash plants are dead. I knew that I needed to have backup squash plants, so I kind of figured out succession planting with them. I didn't really call it succession planting. I just thought I needed to have some when the bugs kill the first batch, right? Well, I learned from my friend Amy at Amy's Garden who is a big vegetable and flower farmer, that they succession plant, they plant tomatoes, peppers, um, lots of crops more than once. You know how we all rush out there and plant our tomatoes at the beginning of the season and then we wonder, why don't we have beautiful tomatoes in September, in October even maybe? Because disease has taken out that first batch or the deer have eaten them to the ground or something has happened to them or they just aren't as productive. Well, the secret for flower for farmers is they plant a second planting of those things. So it's not just um, flowers that we do that with, it's also with vegetables. So you really need to change up the way that we're thinking. Most warm season annual vegetables and flowers can be planted more than once if you have a, you know, four month at least frost-free growing time. I actually have a six month, six to seven month most often, frost-free time. So we actually plant four times. We don't plant tomatoes and peppers four times, we plant them twice, but all of our annual plants we do. So back to our succession planting. The first thirds in cool flowers, we are, um, we are planting, we are harvesting cool flowers the first summer succession is planted, and then the, th the third third is gonna be the second planting. Well, when that second planting's kind of being planted, guess what starts to happen? The cool season, and that can be vegetables too, y'all. That's not just, I mean, that's peas and beets and lettuce and broccoli and cauliflower and all that stuff. All of that stuff is starting to peter out because guess what? We're getting into the heat of summer, right? So that's where my third rotation goes. So this not only stretches out the work, but it stretches out your seed starting. You can also change up varieties of stuff you're growing, colors of stuff you're growing for flowers. I mean, there's just so many options when you just change up your strategy a little bit and consider succession planting. Um, and as I've mentioned before, we start 
pretty much everything we possibly can indoors. It's just simply less work. We have a better stand of plants and we don't waste seeds because you have, when you direct seed outside, you have to over sow, right? You have to over plant and then you have to thin, you have to hoe to keep the weeds down that are also trying to sprout at the same time as your seeds are. So, but some seeds just really do best planted in the garden. So we choose that when um, we have to, right? So, the fast, and so someone asked this question, but, and I wanna just say that in addition to soil blocking, allowing me to really be able to start large numbers of seedlings inside a building like this without drainage problems, another part of the gift of soil blocking is that you cut like a third of the growing time off compared to a conventional plug tray or whatever container you're starting seeds in. And it's because soil blocks create such a healthy environment, the blocks um, get so much oxygen to the roots, they just simply grow so much quicker. Um, so let's see here. Um, so I wanna just stop right now before I start looking at talking and answering questions. I wanna remind you, if you want to help me so I can keep doing these things, please like this broadcast after it's done and share it on your timeline. Um, that'll save it for you as well as that really helps me with Facebook, right? And then they're always put onto my blog about a week afterwards. And for anybody just joining us, I'm going to give you the um, three announcements that I started off with. I have an online course seed starting made easy that teaches you how to sow seeds out in the garden and be successful as well as how to soil block when to start seeds i'm giving you a five dollar off coupon code the coupon code for the seed starting course is easy and i have a free webinar if anybody's thinking they might like want to be a flower farmer or they're wondering if they can be a flower farmer or do they have what it takes? I'm doing a free webinar in a couple of weeks. Yeah, in a couple of weeks. Um, and But you have to sign up for that. It's not gonna be on Facebook. Um, and you can go to our website, thegardenersworkshop.com, go to online courses and it's right there, free webinar, sign up and we'll send you the link to attend that. And if you can't attend live, then we'll send you the link to watch it sometime later. And as I mentioned earlier, almost all the questions that I get and the phone calls we get here, which I cannot um, answer all those questions, almost all of them are answered in my book, Vegetables Love Flowers and Cool Flowers, for those of you that haven't seen them. Um, and we have them on our website and we give free shipping and I'd love to sign a copy for you. So now I'm gonna go through the questions that were posted in several different places in social media. Mary Beth asked me about um, the process of sprouting. She saw that beautiful tray of um, status. I'm gonna grab it. So she saw this beautiful tray of status, which you can see here. Um, which actually is starting to look a little bad because guess what? It should have been planted last week. But with all the rain, we just have nowhere to put it because I will tell you, we have not lost any cool flowers that were planted last fall. We always kind of count on something dying off. And um, you just... We don't have anywhere to put these, so I have to make a bed and of course it's too wet. So her question was, what do I do to get them to look like this? So beautiful and healthy and green and notice how short they are because they've been under adequate light. So she asked, what is the process? After they sprout, we sprout them on a heat mat in a room that's about 65 to 70 degrees air temperature. Heat mats on about 68, 70 degrees. We sprout them. They're immediately moved over to grow lights. I ha it depends on what kind of grow light as to how close that you um, put them. And the room temperature, it just really depends. So if I don't have any thing on the heat mat, because the heat mat is in the room where the grow lights are. 
And so if there is nothing on the heat mat and all the seeds have sprouted, cool season seeds, whether it's vegetables or flowers, really need warm soil, cool air. So during seed sprouting time in that room, I'm really conscious of what the air temperature is, but after everybody has sprouted, like right now we have no seed sprouting. We won't start that till next week for warm season stuff. So I've kind of cranked the heat up in that room, which just means we start closing the door so that the heat's trapped in there along with the grow lights. Because if you want plants to grow and grow at a rate, a good rate, they need warmth, right? So we kind of, I guess, so this building, I'm just looking at the thermostat, the building kind of downstairs here stays at about 66 degrees is what my thermostat is set on. Set on. Then I have that room that's over there that's, you know, it's, it's, this is an insulated building and it's got windows, big windows, as well as, there is a bee flying around in here. I wonder where he came from. Um, there's windows and there's a lot of grow lights in there. So that room, when the door is shut, gets warmer. And that's how I grow these beautiful plants. And we water once a week. Well, I water every day. But once a week, I add liquid Neptune's Harvest to my watering can. So, Laurie, this answers your question too. Laurie asked, said that her seeds have germinated, but they're not growing. I'm telling you, it's either too cool or not enough light. Light and temperature is really the big bust on most seed starting. So Helen says she has trouble starting celosia seeds. I will tell you that I think that our we are superstar celosia growers. Celosias do not like to be grown in plug trays. They don't like, they resist being root bound. And I, I didn't know that in the beginning. I was a soil blocker from the beginning and we started growing lots of celosias because our florists like them so much and celosia loves soil blocks. Celosia is a warm season tender annual, so it needs heat. So like next week when we start our all of that stuff, I'll bump the temperature up in this building probably to 68 or 70 degrees, keep the door shut on that room, and it'll get up to 85 or 90 degrees in the afternoon when the sun is shining, assuming the sun is gonna shine again someday. Um, so, Celosia needs heat, and they love to be started in soil blocks, to answer that. So Amy has asked, low germination on heat, so that must mean a seedling heat mat, and it, the, her room temperature is 63 to 68, but she, because of space problems, she, her heat mat is under grow lights, and she has T5 light bulbs. So here's the thing with, I'm, I'm not gonna give you a lesson on lights, because I just know a little bit about lights. Lights that I use are fluorescent strips, okay? They're not LED lights. There are T5s, T8s, and T12s. The lower the number, the smaller the bulb. This is about the size of a T5. The smaller the bulb, the more heat they give off. And when you have T5s, which I have five fixtures of T5s, and I do not like them. If I hadn't paid so much money for them, I'd have gotten rid of them a long time ago. But I have to keep them like 24 inches off of my seedlings, or they'll toast them. So if you have your blocks, or whatever you're starting in, on a heat mat and under T5s, you're probably toasting your seedlings, and that, what I would say, um, is probably the problem. So, somebody asked, she had trouble with I, I didn't quite understand. I think it, I can't even read my own handwriting. Celia, maybe? Trouble with direct, trouble starting seeds that want to be direct seeded. I didn't understand if you're trying to start them inside or direct seeding. So, if you're trying to start seeds indoors that really prefer to be started outdoors, you need to start them outdoors. That's it's the whole temperature thing. And that is something that I talk about in Vegetables Love Flowers, Cool Flowers, and in both of the courses, um, because it's I can't answer that in a minute or less. But you can be a successful seed starter out in the garden. You just have to follow a couple of ground rules. So Stacy asked, said that some of her seedlings have gotten leggy, which means they were stretching for light, right? And she was wondering, should she trash them? Or 
put the light closer and just go for it. You know, I wouldn't trash them if you have room. Now, if you don't have enough room to start new ones, um, to get nice, short, stocky, I will tell you that seedlings that we plant that are short and stocky, like that status I just showed you, they produce more flowers, are more disease and pest resistant than a stretched seedling that we plant because it didn't get enough light. They just struggle forever. You know, I mean, it's like being puny for the rest of their life. So trash them if you don't have room to start new ones and keep both. So how does that answer your question? And whenever anything is stretching or yellow looking, almost always it's low light. You need more light. So Aaron asked about the air temperature for cool flowers. I think 65 to 75 degrees, 65 to 70 when you're in the sprouting stage and then a little bit warmer once you're trying to grow the plants, right? So Jennifer um, had a flower farming question, which I can't really answer here. And I think her question was, what should a first year flower farmer grow? And I would say two things to you. You need to sign up for the free webinar. What does it take to be a flower farmer? And I also have an online course called the Easy Cut Flower Garden, which is for a home cutting garden, but that is a perfect course. It's 20 bucks. That is a perfect course for a new flower farmer or a home gardener to watch because it takes you through the whole step. And I tell you what I grow, those are the workhorses from my farm. And I also share in that online course how to build soil with a shovel. So that's a really good one. And sign up for the webinar, Jennifer. They're both on the website under online courses. So Lacey asked about what seeds are difficult. Well, first off, I don't start any difficult seeds because I want to show you something else now and I'll come back to her question. So some of you may or may not, if you're not a flower farmer, you may not even know what these are. These are Lysianthus plugs. And I do not start Lysianthus. These are plugs that arrived in a box here last week. Um, they would have already been planted this last week. See how there's a difference in size? These, this, this tray is definitely big enough to be planted out in my garden. These, which have really gotten bigger since we've had them, are just too tiny. And it's just a waste of labor for us to only plant part of a crop. So we're going to decline a phone call there. Sorry, y'all. Um, so, Lysianthus aren't necessarily hard to start. They are a slow grower. These Lysianthus you just saw are already 12 weeks. They're probably 13 weeks old by now. Do you know how many ways you can kill a seedling in 12 to 13 weeks? A lot of ways. So, I don't bother starting them. So, I would put them in the difficult category. Campanula and Delphiniums are also difficult. And I, if I was growing Campanula or Delphiniums, I would buy plugs of those too. It's just more economical. Most often the seed is not inexpensive and then you go and try to start them. You have low germination. Um, so, and I do not start anything that needs special treatment to the seed like stratification other than putting them in the freezer um, and then bringing them out. That's about the most special treatment that I do. Shirley asks, what to start now in southeastern Virginia? Well, surely, um, vegetables love flowers. We'll lay that all out for you. We're starting next week. Warm season tender annuals is what we're on the verge of here. So Meg has a question about grow lights and what I recommend. So as I just mentioned, there's three sizes, T5s, which we do not sell. I do not like them. Um, and I, so I have T5s, I have some T8s, and I have some T12s. T12s and T8s basically put the same volume of light out. It's the T8s are a little bit more economical um, to run. They aren't necessarily the same price as T12s. They're more expensive. So sometimes I use T12 fixtures or I buy T12 fixtures. So I, we sell T12 fixtures because they're the most economical to purchase. They go the long haul and we really like them and you can put them right on top of your seedlings. That's what grew these statuses you just saw there. 
So um, Jairus asked about natural. So one of the things that came along with my Lysianthus were fungus gnats. That is standard operating when you buy from big greenhouses um, that they treat um, they treat for fungus gnats weekly, just like we do. And when those plants get put in that box to ship for me, they just break out. So when you open the box, they're out there. I always open my box outside and immediately start treating them. So I, once a week, just like once a week I fertilize my seedlings, once a week I add natural, which is a BT. You can look that up online. We do not sell it. Um, and actually, I left the bottle in there. It's G-N-A-T-R-O-L, I think. And any other brand, I think that's like a brand name. Um, we just put it in the water once a week and treat. That kills larva that's in the soil, which is where the babies live. And then we also use those yellow sticky traps um, that I just clipped to my racks in there, and that catches the adults. And after about three or four weeks, you get it under control and they're gone. So that's how we do it. And yes, Susan, there is room for you um, in the webinar, no problem. Lauren asks, different variety. Okay, so Lauren asked about, she was starting Snapdragons and we start a bunch of different varieties, those of us that grow cut flowers. And she noticed that one variety of snaps, I think it was Madame Butterfly, took longer to germinate than Chantilly. And yes, you're in fact right. Um, the great example I often give when I'm teaching seed starting is how tomatoes are that way. So one, the one year we were growing a bunch of, we grow a bunch of tomatoes here. We put, we use a big tray, but I don't need 240 of one variety of tomatoes, right? So we put like blocks of 20 clusters of tomatoes, multiple clusters with a different tomato variety in each cluster. And so after a couple of days, one variety popped. A couple of days later, another variety popped. And that went on for about a week and I realized the error of my ways. We were having to take a spatula and lift off the clusters and putting them under light while we waited for some of the other clusters that hadn't germinated yet. Roma tomatoes, by the way, took like 28 days to pop. And then we got 100% germination. So even within a family, tomatoes or snaps, going from different varieties, you can have totally different germination time. So you definitely need to only put one type on a tray. So Caroline asked about why soil blocks grow so much quicker. And I think I already mentioned that because soil blocks are not in a container, they're just in soil and they get oxygen and their roots get air pruned, they just grow. So, so this status is five weeks old. I mean, it should have been planted last week, right? So really it would have been planted at four weeks where most people growing in plug trays planted at six to eight weeks. So it's the container or the lack of a container. So Kathy asked about having germination issues with a Rebecca and then Aaron also about a fever few that they apparently had good luck. And then when they planted some more later, they didn't have good luck. And they think that they did the very same thing both times. I can almost promise you it's temperature. Temperature has so much to do with germination because as the season moves along, our rooms are different temperatures. Um, so that's the oh, that's where I would start looking at. If you did everything else the same, then I would look at the air temperature that was in the room. And if you have a heat mat that has a built-in thermostat, the warmer temperature in a house will raise that temperature also. So Christine asked about why her seedlings were leggy, low light. I will say that a hundred times um, because it's a common question. If you have seedlings that are stretching and growing tall and getting gangly and yellow, they need light. So Abigail asked about growing Lizzie's and seedlings. And yes, once they germinate, you move them off the heat mat and they need to grow between 65 and 70 degrees for 12 weeks, so good luck with that. Um, that's why we buy them in. They're just, it's just hard to manage them. So Emily asked about her Bells of Ireland having trouble, 
And there would be a lot of questions I would have about that. And if you've read Cool Flowers um, or watched the course, you'll know that we freeze the seed and soak the seed and we recommend direct seeding it outside. So I don't know if you did those steps or not, um, but we have 100% germination when we follow those steps. Andrea asked about mold on soil blocks. And so, so mold grows in constant moisture. So we really try to allow our soil blocks to dry out. We try to keep the temperature in our room so that the soil blocks dry out every day. When I go in in the morning to water, they are bone dry. I mean bone dry. And so that's kind of, but the plants haven't wilted or anything. They're just coming off of overnight with no light and that prevents mold. So constant moisture is the problem. So it's all about managing how you're watering and figuring that out kind of for you. So somebody over on Instagram asked for Lysianthus germination tips. And it's just, yes, you use heat, but it is lower heat. And as I've talked before, it's just, they're a little bit more difficult. Um, somebody from Instagram, I think it was Skipping Fox Farms, asked how far in advance to start seeds and when do you transplant them? Again, that is so, I go into that in depth in Vegetables Love Flowers as well as in the course seed starting because it, it, it can vary from seed to seed. So you kind of have to group your seeds and figure that out for where you are. Um, and somebody asked how long are lights on? That's 16 hours a day. And we talked about gnats. Now I'm gonna scroll back here and see what y'all are saying. So we got lots of hellos, everybody. I'm so glad that we got a bunch of people on here. And so let's see, oh, and Alma, my cousin, is from sunny Florida. She's in Fort Lauderdale. Um, so I can't wait for spring either, I'm telling you. Let's see. Let's see what questions we have. Oh, four inches of snow, boo hiss. You need some moral support for seed starting. I'll tell you, um, seed starting, once you get it, so if you're struggling, I would definitely recommend that you watch the seed starting online course. It's 15 bucks if you use the coupon, easy. That's only good for um, till March 15th of 2019 for anybody watching this after that date. It won't work. But if you need a refresher, it's me taking you through all the steps. And again, you can watch it as much as you want. South Carolina, five, oh, Wanda. Let's see, oh, somebody's heading to the Philly Flower Show. You had six foot zinnias last year. I'm telling you, they're, why is book called Vegetables Love Flowers? Sounds like a companion planting book. Well, let's see, who is that? That's Joanne. It is called Vegetables Love Flowers, Companion Planting for Beauty and Bounty. So it is companion planting, but it's the original companion planting. It is not plant this flower next to this vegetable. It is having the presence of flowers in your vegetable patch to bring in nature's most powerful pest control and pollinators. Um, it's the way that we grow farm organically on this farm, and it is far easier to manage than a um, specific plant, this flower next to this vegetable to hopefully prevent this pest from coming. Um, it is a much broader, easier way to manage that. So it is, and first off, um, what most people don't realize is I didn't pick that name. Your publisher kind of does that for you. I agreed to it um, because I kind of felt like too that um, it's not the traditional what people have thought of, but in fact, this is um, the most broad, probably most oldest type of companion planting. So it is about growing flowers in your vegetable patch and how to do that. So let's see, just received my soil blocking equipment. Oh, good, Carrie. Been using trays in prior years and I'm excited to start soil blocking. You know, it is so different to go from plug trays to soil blocking and there's a learning curve. So please, I don't know if, if you got a kit or not because the kit comes with the soil blocking course, um, but it really helps for that refresher. 
When do you know it's time to plant sunflower plugs in the field? Well, we plant sunflowers right at the last frost date and we only want them to be two to three weeks old in a plug tray. So you don't want them to get too big. So somebody's asking what percentage should you overplant? So I, you're talking about starting seeds. I mentioned that we always start more seeds than plants that we need because stuff just happens. And I would say, it depends on, if it's a really expensive seed, I don't go quite this high, um, but I sometimes almost go 30 to 50% more. Um, if it's an inexpensive seed, but you gotta be strong, you gotta be able to do something, we just compost those plants. They end up turning around and coming back in the garden um, through compost, so, but if it is an expensive hybrid seed, typically, the pricey seeds have stronger germination, so we don't go quite so high. Question, you said you use heat mats. You also have a germination chamber. Are they interchangeable? How do you determine mats or chambers if you were to only have one which? So Howard, I have found that the cool season hardy annual vegetables and flowers do best started on heat mats cool air temperature, warm soil. Some of them will do okay in a germination chamber, but overall we have just found that they, that cool air and warm soil just really changes that. Um, and, but when all of our warm season tender annuals, we'll fire up our, our germination chamber next week. And then when we run out of room, we use them both. So if you had to have only one I'd probably have heat mats. Um, germination chamber is um, kind of for big production. So I would, I mean, I just had heat mats until I've had a chamber for four or five years. So let's see. Welcome home. Yes, thank you. Maybe you need to read your book aloud on Facebook <laughs> to the class since we, well, I mean, I understand everybody wants instant gratification, and I do give away tons of resources. So, but everybody has to do their part too. And, you know, and this is how big of a dinosaur I am. You know, I had to read books and magazines to learn how to farm. We didn't have all this. And I think that that was such a benefit to me. I learned about stuff instead of just figuring out seed starting, you know, I had to read the whole book on farming that included seed starting, and there's great benefits to that. So, yes, you have to do your reading, and that we've tried to create for those people that don't want to read quite so much the online courses that you can watch them over and over. So, what if the heat mat is a higher temperature? So, she must have been, Candace, I'm sorry, you must have probably asked that when I was talking about something. So there's two kinds of heat mats. One has a built-in thermostat. That thermostat goes off of the air temperature. And if you think your heat mat is too warm for cool season seeds, we put a cookie cooling rack on the heat mat to create a little air space and that cools it down a little bit. So I don't know if that's what your question. Yes, Susan, there is room for you to sign up for the webinar. Um, I know that you're probably not gonna be a commercial farmer, but um, you're welcome to join with it. We have several hundred more spaces. We already filled hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of spaces, but I went to the next level. So I think that takes us, um, so you'll be fine. You don't want, you're, you'll be fine. You're welcome, Aaron. Um, look forward to the webinar. I went out knee-deep snow. Oh, gosh, knee-deep snow. I'm so glad I'm just wet here. Snow this morning to measure space for my flower beds. There you go. You know, there is a, I had a saying. I posted this last year. I have to dig it out. It basically says, I can't remember what the actual saying was, but it's like, how much more powerful are you by spending time reading and planning and reading seed catalogs, not just looking at pictures and ordering seeds, but reading what it says about them, then you are to be buying products to solve problems in the middle of summer. You know what I mean? That's what people do. They just plant stuff and then they get freaked out because they have a problem and run to the garden center and buy some chemical or something to fix the problem. And once you have a little bit of knowledge, you don't have to do any of that mess. I mean, we use zero here 
on our farm. So let's see, Lynn, thanks for the advice on starting eucalyptus. Have great germination. Great, two week old babies, yeah. Eucalyptus is like Lysianthus. It's just a slow one sometimes. And that just, again, gives us more opportunities to kill it in different ways, whether it be overwatering, not watering enough, or not having the correct room temperatures. Your weekly Facebook Live make winter bearable. Aw, Susan, you're too sweet. Tips for Madam Butterfly after germination. They seem to like heat. So yeah, after they've germinated, the snap, snaps are pretty picky. They're pretty persnickety, that's the word for them. So once they've sprouted, yes, they want a little bit of heat, a warm room to grow in. And we, you know, as I um, have mentioned before, we pinch our snaps before we plant them, especially those specialty snaps, Madam Butterfly, Chantilly, all them because it just makes a hardier plant. Lisa would highly recommend, oh, any of Lisa's courses. Thank you, Charity. You gain lots of knowledge and support. Yeah, and so the other thing I will mention here too as we're, I mean, it's March, but fall will be here before we know it. Flower Farming School Online, we'll do that again this fall. If you go to the online courses and go to that course, Flower Farming School, which is a six week course, and sign up to be notified. We'll send you a special coupon to use. It's a small window of opportunity. Um, and it is a lot of information. And I'm on an exclusive closed Facebook page with those people. And um, I pay very close attention and try to keep after all their questions. So that's a great way to connect. Amy, how long do you harden off your seedlings under your carport? How long do you leave them out first day? I'm in zone six. If you're talking about cool season, I typically will put them out for the day. If it's going down below 30 degrees at night, I might bring them back in. But unless it's getting, like it's going down to the low 20s on Monday night, so I'll bring all my seedlings back in. But generally, when I put them out there, I put them out, unless it's going really, really low. How close together can I plant Bupleurum? So let's look at one of those. So I plant, um, and you can look back on a past Lisa Live about how to get Bupleurum to germinate in plug trays. This is some that was, let's see, that says February uh, 7th or 8th. These aren't very old. These are about three or four weeks old. And see, stuff grows slower in plug trays, y'all. Um, so when we plant Bupleurum in plug trays, we sow in the garden in the fall. We put two or three seeds in every cell because Bupleurum typically is a one cut crop. That's one of the things we teach a lot of in flower farming school, which of those you can count on. It's one cut, you cut it and it's gone. So we crowd them, we plant them six inches apart and then there's usually two or three plants on each one. I mean, it's really tight because we don't get any branching here in the south. So let's see how close together. So there you go. And I put, when we are planting transplants, I put four rows in a 30 inch bed. When I'm sowing seeds, it's just three rows. Do you start all of your seeds, even easier stuff like sunflowers and soul blocks and not plug trays? I start sunflowers and plug trays because we start so many of them every week. We start 500 a week now. We used to start 50, um, 1,200 every week, and that's just too that's just too labor intensive to make the soul blocks. So, soul blocks. I mean, sunflowers, bupleurum. I buy Lizzie's and plug trays. Um, those, and then the millet that we plant every week with sunflowers, we start in plug trays. Everything else is in soul blocks, pretty much. Books are the best. Thank you, Jennifer. <laughs> I had to finally open the books to learn and had to take notes. I hear you. Um, so glad you said that. A meter of snow. Oh, my goodness. Oh, she's up in Canada. I'm sorry. That is the pits. Okay. Just wondered if you could discuss days to maturity for seeds. I have read too much, and I think you asked that on Facebook, and I just hadn't gotten to answer that yet, and we got to step on it here, y'all. The way that I understand it is when it says days to maturity, that is from the day you start the seed. So if you 
Start the seed today like pro-cut sunflowers are 55 to 60 days. 55 to 60 days after I start that seed, they're blooming, right? So if you test that out on a good grower that you're growing, like a sunflower, look it up, see what many days it's supposed to have, and then notate, I don't know what my dog is doing. Barry, what are you doing? She's rolling around. Um, test it out and you'll see how that works. Of course, people's different growing um, conditions can affect that, right? Um, so days to maturity is from seed to bloom. That's the way I take it. That's the way I understand. Will the webinar contain the same info you cover online? For, oh no. So Wanda's asking about the, the free webinar is just, the name of it is, what does it take to be a flower farmer? So it's not about teaching you how to be a flower farmer. It's about people that are wondering, can I do this? Um, you know, I wasn't even barely a gardener when I just started to be a flower farmer and I live in the middle of the city. Um, and so there's a lot of people that just aren't sure or they're just starting out, they might need struggling. So it's more of a um, help people to kind of confirm in their mind. So no, Wanda, it's not like flower farming school. Covering all that or additional information. So it's just different information, but it's not about teaching that. If I left them on the heat mat too long after germination, have I ruined them? I see that too much heat will affect flowering later. I'm assuming they've germinated. Um, Lizzie's don't like to, I wonder what these look like. They don't like to be, um, so see, this is the perfect way to plant them. See how the, the roots have just grown to the edge but now they're gonna, so Bobo's not planting these for 10 days. So we will really um, be on the edge of affecting them. You don't want them to get root bound is what I'm saying. Um, so I think you're all right. I think you just do the best you can. These others are just so small. I can't even pull them up. I'll pull them out by their roots. Um, so I don't think you've ruined them. Keep going, just get them into 65 to 70 degree room temperature and just try not to kill them. That's the deal. I mean, that's me. I'm trying not to kill these. I already decided that's the course I want to take this fall. Oh, Jennifer. And be sure and sign up because I'll tell you. So Flower Farming School cost went up $100 over the first year we did it last year because we're adding, well, first off, we know now what it takes. Um, and we will send you a $50 coupon off of that price if you sign up. So go for it. And we're going to spend all summer adding a lot of great videos, which all the people that took it last year will have, still have access to all of that. You have access to all that stuff for the rest of your life. Thanks for answering my question. One more easy one. Can you please spell natal? It's natrol. G-N-A-T-R-O-L is the one I have. And the bottle I have is really old, so they might not be making that brand anymore. Becky replied, oh, you will not be disappointed. Thank you so much, Becky. And yeah, people that took Flower Farming School, a lot of people have already reviewed it. We have uh, tons of reviews, but if you haven't, we'd love to share your review with folks. Um, what vendor do you purchase starts from? I go, you have to go to a plant broker. Um, and so you go to Germania Seeds and go to their plant department, and Raker is the one that I get them from. And they tell you, it's a matter of which variety you want and all that good, and what size you want. Um, under 20 inches of snow, oh my goodness, you're so welcome, Venus. As always, excellent, I learned so much. Oh, you're welcome. So, y'all, I have to go. I am going to cook a meal for a funeral family. Um, so, once again, I just wanna say, Please like and share this. After we're done, I'll broadcast it. You can find all my Lisa Lives on my blog. Just find the first one, hit Lisa Live on the category and it'll bring all of them up. You can watch. Um, oh, thank you, Charity. Um, so yes, I am involved in the course. I do it all. We go out in the garden. Uh, we just have a lot of really special stuff for Flower Farming School coming this fall. And so like and share, remember the $5 off coupon for the seed starting online course code is easy. So it's gonna be 15 bucks, $14.95, what a deal. Go to the website, thegardenersworkshop.com and sign up for our newsletter. 
Um, I usually send out a blog. We might highlight one product a week. We don't spam you, but we really try to create a lot of great content and just highlight our website that is so full. So, hey, I'm going to make lasagna, jello, salad. I'm not making bad bread. I brought bread and making brownies so they can have hot fudge. Um, brownies with ice cream. So thank you guys so much. I'm just looking at my notes. I'll get off here and think, oh my goodness, I was supposed to say this. I told you to like and share. So hey, till we meet again, and um, thank you all so much. And sharing this with your other growing friends on any groups that you're a member of, other groups, you know, closed groups, share it, please. We really appreciate it. And thank you for all the love that's going up. You're welcome, Emily. Happy cooking for me. That's right. Thank you.